Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Anna Karugati, the Group Editorial Director of WorldScreen. I am absolutely delighted to be here, not only because the gentleman to my left is such an expert in his field, he's also a dear old friend. So, so you promised to be easy on me as yes, a result. Yes, yes, maybe. <laughs> um, this is Stephen Davis. Uh, he has a very short title, so I'm going to try and get it right. Correct me if I'm wrong. Chief uh, Content Officer and Executive Vice President of Hasbro, President of Global Entertainment and Licensing, and President of Hasbro Studios. I have the largest business cards in the world. They fold. All right, I think we want to start with a video that gives a bit of a taste of what all of those titles mean. <laughs> yeah, so what you're going to see is just a kind of short little taster of some of the animation, recent animation that we've produced for television, about 60 seconds, I think. So why don't we roll tape? Okay, so all great stories have a beginning, right? So Hasbro Studios was set up in 2009? 2009. What was the goal? What was a remit back then? Well, you know, Hasbro has so many great stories to tell. First of all, Hasbro has the uh, privilege of owning over 1,500 brands. And we really wanted to have a platform to be able to tell those stories and frankly to be much more in control of our destiny as a production and distribution company. So in 2009, we started Hasbro Studios. Um, around the same time, we also invested in what was then in the US, uh, Discovery Kids, which was then rebranded The Hub, which was then subsequently rebranded again to Discovery Family. And um, we started to really expand our relationships with our digital partners as well. And um, then about two years ago, um, in the similar vein, we announced AllSpark Pictures, which is our um, own film label, which gives us, again, the opportunity to really control our destiny in film, as we have in television. And so we're now uh, producing our own films, financing our own films. Controlling marketing and calendarization is such an important part of what we do across all platforms. So our ability to be able to really green light television through Hasbro Studios, green light our film um, through AllSpark really kind of completes the picture for us. Okay, so given your many responsibilities, how do you view the children's market? Because 2009 to today, it's like five lifetimes it in really terms is. of technology yeah. and how children right. have changed and the landscape. It's like, the, it's like faster than the Industrial Revolution. Exactly. I mean, it's really interesting. First of all, I will say, and I mean it from the bottom of my heart, everybody says this every year, I don't think there's a better time to be in the kids' market than there is today. First of all, because um, you know, even compared to 2009, the number of platforms that are available to uh, expose your content have never been uh, larger. And, and frankly, the democratization of content, that kids are actually making their own content, I think has opened up an appetite amongst our core consumer base to want to seek out more content opportunities. Um, and you know, again, because Hasbro is a branded play company, it has its heritage um, as a toy and game company, we call ourselves a branded play company, we bring play to life, our core consumer is kids, kids and families. So um, never a better time to take our brands and um, create great immersive entertainment experiences that are spot on where uh, the consumer is today. Right. Um, now, I imagine Hasbro is widely considered just a toy company, right? I mean, when people hear Hasbro, is that... It's so, a, so you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fair misconception that Hasbro is a toy company. I mean, the company was founded in uh, 1923 
So, you know, we... And Hasbro stands for, I remember. Ah, uh, the founders, Hassenfeld Brothers. So it's Hasbro, Hassenfeld Brothers. Yeah. See, I did my research. Yes, and Alan Hassenfeld, uh, who uh, is the great-grandson, is uh, still on our board of directors. So, yeah, it's still, although we're a public company, it's very much a family-oriented company, and it has its roots as a family-owned toy and game company. But clearly, we have evolved substantially. Um, you know, we put storytelling at the center of everything that we do, and that really is driving um, our strategy across the platform, the ecosystem that we're trying to create. Right. Um, okay, so the market is quite competitive. Children have a million different entertainment options, different screens, different... Um, what are the challenges in getting their attention? I mean, they're savvy. They know where they to are, find yeah. what they want. Well, and I think the other thing that has made it even more challenging is that kids are their own programmers now. They're not waiting to be told right. what to watch because um, their choices are so wide. They can find content on so many different platforms, and they want it when they want it. They don't want to wait for it. And, you know, we've looked at that challenge as an opportunity. Again, it goes back to, you know, the fundamental foundation for forming Hasbro Studios and AllSpark Pictures so that we can ensure that anywhere where kids and families are engaging with content, they will see our content. Um, you know, Fit Artists and Nina Scales um, and their sales team spend a tremendous amount of time not only in the bricks and mortar sales of our content, but really understanding what's the next step for distribution? Where are kids? How can we ensure that we get that content in the hands of kids in the right way? And short form content, of course, is also changing the landscape considerably and understanding that it's easy to say you're producing content that lives across all these platforms, but it really isn't all of that easy. Um, and kids' attention span is short. So uh, you have to ensure that the stories that you're telling engage them quickly and uh, because kids multimedia test, there's this great statistic uh, that our research department did a couple of years ago that said that kids are actually bending time. They're multimedia tasking. They're consuming 11 hours of media in about seven hours. That's because they are on multiple platforms at any one time. And you want to be sure that you're engaging them with that content on whatever platform they happen to be focused on during that seven hour period. Right, and they often have more than one, they often have more than one screen in front of them oh, too. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. That's a little scary. It is really scary. We won't uh, go there. It's the ADD generation. Um, 10, 15 years ago, when children loved a property, okay, just to show how much things have changed, they were happy with the TV show on the linear channel, uh, a DVD, and maybe a plush doll or an action figure to extend that fun time after the show was over. Mm -hmm. Today, it's a whole different universe. Yeah. What do they expect nowadays? And, and how does Hasbro satisfy their expectations? Well, I think that kids expect to connect um, more simply. And I, and I think that kids, because of the sort of digital uh, generation, want to be more immersed in their connection with characters and with content. I mean, many of you will know the, you know, trend in our business on the retail side, toys to life, um, you know, Disney Xfinity, our telepods. It's really taking both the physical and the digital and marrying the two so that, you know, a, a boy or a girl can have a physical doll or an action figure, but that that action figure can actually live in a digital content-driven world and that they feel as though they really are connecting with the play pattern that they can determine the story. They can use digital and content to fantasize and create the stories that is the genesis for why any kid buys uh, Pinkie Pie or Optimus Prime. Right. Uh, that was a good plug, wasn't it? Pinkie Pie, not yet. So we have to get there to you. You have to get their attention. Mm -hmm. You have to get a good product. You have to tell good stories. There's also a retail strategy behind what you do. The landscape has changed so much. How do you drive a consumer product strategy nowadays? You know, coincidentally, I happen to have a slide. <laughs> Can you throw that slide up? Thanks. So um, this, is, this is Hasbro's brand blueprint. And as you can see at the center of our brand blueprint, 
we put storytelling and consumer insights. So the storytelling piece, we kind of covered um, and we'll cover a little bit more. Another really critical part of what we do is listening. We spend a considerable amount of time and resource in consumer testing, listening to our consumers, the things that they like and that they don't like, not only just in a general kind of industry standard, but we actually put our product in front of our consumers, we put our content in front of consumers, and we ask them the tough questions, and we listen. And it's interesting, Transformers Robots in Disguise, which you saw the clip of, was the second generation of Transformers, the animated series. It was originally Transformers Prime, and then we went into a, into a new series. R.I.D. is a reflection of everything that kids liked and also didn't like about Transformers Prime. It's the first consumer generated series that Hasbro has ever done. And that came out of a considerable amount of consumer insights. So between activating our brands through storytelling and the consumer insights that we get from boys and girls, moms and dads, we then effectively use that as our kind of tool in the arsenal to stimulate our toy and game business, our lifestyle licensing business, creating immersive entertainment experiences through digital, and um, the overall digital landscape. So we feel like that's kind of our secret sauce. The reason that we are so successful in creating this great content and consumer products ecosystem is that that's how we're activating our business and our strategy. Part of that too is obviously focusing on markets, you know, develop, developing and emerging markets, um, all of which get equal weighting with us. Are there any questions from the audience at this point? Somebody must have a question. What is lifestyle licensing? Lifestyle licensing is effectively out licensing. Anything that um, relates to our taking one of our brands and um, putting it effectively in the hands of a licensee. We have a brand called Gem and the Holograms, for instance, a movie that's coming out October 23rd. Please write that all down and go to the box office, buy a ticket, see it. Um, and uh, we, we sort of seeded the market with Gem and the Holograms. It was a brand that we incubated in the 80s. It was very successful, and then we kind of rested it for a while, and we brought it back. So Gem um, is a great sort of coming-of-age story. We are not going to initially do a Gem doll, but we're going to use licensing, lifestyle licensing, to stimulate the blueprint that you just saw. We have licensees like Sephora who are doing a Gem and the Holograms makeup line. We have um, uh, fashion and beauty licensees that will uh, show the expression of Gem on t-shirts and on shoes. We have some consumable uh, categories. So that's using licensing as a way to incubate your brand. Not all brands necessarily warrant initially or might not justify um, a, a toy play, although hopefully you, you know, end up getting there, but you don't always get there, so. <laughs> well, you're gonna see a new Transformers movie coming from Hasbro and Paramount and Michael Bay and, uh, and our other partners. In fact, we just finished, uh, which some of you may have read, just an incredible experience. We decided that we wanted to plot out the next 10 years of the Transformers franchise. And so we got together in a room over a three month period of time, nine of some of the most creative writers I have ever worked with, um, shepherded by Akiva Goldsman, who many of you may know, uh, won an Academy Award for Beautiful Mind and written a bunch of really great movies. And they plotted out the next 10 years of Transformers. Similarly, we're doing the same in television and in digital. So um, stay tuned. Transformers 5 is on its way. And 6 and 7 and 8. There's a question back there. Hello, um, I'm Metsa Maria from Finland, from Sunny Night Productions. Um, I've got a question about your testing with your audience. Um, do you, you said that you are testing your, the products, so could you please tell some like, brief examples of that? 
And then another question, uh, do you do any testing with, um, with development, the characters? I mean, like, do you test, for instance, My Little Ponies, their colors or eyes? Or, and mm -hmm. if you do, so could you please tell me how you test it? That's interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I don't want to reveal too many secrets, but, <clears throat> um, you know, testing of product and of content is really as simple as putting um, a, a demographic in a room, whatever that demographic is, whether it's preschool kids or tweens or moms or dads, and sometimes we put them all together, and we just show them lots of different expressions of the brand. In product, we show them different um, ways of presenting that product, different uh, play patterns, the way that uh, kids might interact with um, an action figure or a doll. And similarly in content, we show them um, some of our TV or filmed entertainment that have certain storylines and get their reaction. And sometimes they're brutally honest and they say, we don't like that character or we don't like that color or we don't really find this engaging on board. Hopefully, most of the time, they say, it's fantastic, I love what you're doing. We listen to that, too. But it's, it's as important to listen to the criticism, the constructive criticism, as it is the accolades. Yeah, there's a question. From, yeah, Anand Vanvari from India. Hi, uh, very interesting. Where are the new ideas for toys coming? Where do they keep coming from? And because the kids are changing now, the way they are engaging. And so how are you working on the, the science of these yeah, toys. It's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. I mean, listen, Hasbro has remained relevant because innovation is so important. And, you know, first of all, you get a new generation every couple of years, so you have to remain relevant. And as I said earlier, the digitalization in the broadest sense of the, of the word has also um, really challenged, in a positive way, but challenged our business. We actually have an innovation team. It's a fascinating group of people who literally spend 24-7 you know, looking, thinking, listening, exploring, talking, experimenting, um, that really push all of us in both the consumer products um, and in the content side of our business to remain innovative and relevant. Actually, one of the best meetings uh, that I go to once a month is an innovation meeting where they come in and just kind of expose us to all kinds of really cool new things, which we then use to influence the rollout of, uh, of both our product and our content. <laughs> a lot, <laughs> a lot. You know, you have to look, you have to kiss a lot of frogs before you find your princess or your <laughs> prince. Okay, hang on to your questions because we, time is going quickly. I will get back to you. Um, but first I want to ask you some of the new properties that Hasbro is coming up with. Well, um, so many of you might know that um, My Little Pony, which is um, one of our most popular girls' brands, we're now um, producing, I think, our 120th, I'm looking at my guys in the audience, over 120 episodes, um, really popular. We're coming out with the new season of My Little Pony, but what, um, what uh, emanated from My Little Pony is a, another brand that's part of the pony world called Equestria Girls. I don't know, anybody familiar with Equestria Girls? Okay. So Equestria Girls, you know, effectively takes the ponies into a somewhat human world where they see their doppelganger, their, you know, equivalent in a human form. Um, so the third movie was just released literally last week, right? Yep, last week. And um, we're now working on a fourth movie. Um, and um, we're looking at different ways of rolling that movie out, um, which is kind of exciting. Um, we have a second season of Transformers uh, Robots in Disguise, um, which uh, we are uh, gonna be rolling out on Cartoon Network and, um, and then uh, other platforms, so. 100, 125 episodes? Over 120. A lot of companies see 52 as their goal. How, how are you able to a, go to that many mm -hmm. um, episodes, and how do you keep a brand like that fresh? Uh, yes, you do have new kids coming in, but what are the challenges in keeping it fresh? Well, first of all, you know, again, we, we have the privilege of having brands that have such great resonance with consumers like Transformers, like My Little Pony, like Littlest Pet Shop. Um, and because we have some of the best and the brightest storytellers that we work with in the business, we're able to obviously sustain those brands because we have this, as you saw in the brand blueprint, 
you know, enormous expression of our brand. So we can support those brands with lots of content, which is really critical to keeping it front and center in front of kids and their families. But we're also um, incredibly um, considered about who we work with, and we really do work with some of the best, most innovative storytellers that help us to keep those stories alive so that, you know, kids don't um, grow bored of them. And we're also looking at ways of presenting content differently. Linear is very important to our strategy, um, uh, and digital is very important to our strategy, but the format of content, you know, that traditional 22 minutes, which still remains kind of the life bulb pulse of our business, we're looking at different ways of telling stories through short form, through immersive experiences, uh, toys to life, other ways to tell stories that will engage kids. You mentioned before um, the hub, which is now Discovery Family. Family. How did the evolution of the network sort of reflect the evolution of the business? Because they yeah. do, they do so mirror it's, each it's, other, it's, don't they? It's really interesting, yeah. So I don't, know, not, I don't know that everybody would agree with this, but you know, what I have found, having been in this business for a very long time, the one thing that has not changed is having a domestic broadcast network is very important to creating a globally... Um, appealing business for yourself to be able to fully monetize it. Now, clearly, uh, platforms like Netflix have done an amazing job of demonstrating that not all content has to go on broadcast, but we felt like we needed to be everywhere where a kid would be consuming content, and that included as part of that ecosystem a broadcast network. Mm -hmm. So when we initially got into the business, and I will say, you know, when we bought um, then 50% uh, of um, Discovery Kids, the digital landscape was very different. The streaming landscape was very different. Now, obviously, it's, uh, you know, it's at the top. But um, at the time, uh, it was important to us to have that anchor in the U.S. to help not only exposure in the U.S., but also give us broader exposure internationally. And um, so we've rebranded the channel. Uh, it's still the highest uh, rated network for uh, co-viewing, kids watching, kids 6 to 11 watching with an adult 18 to 49. Um, and it's still a very critical part of that overall ecosystem. Um, from a distribution perspective, so looking beyond the network in the United States and, and the OTTs in the United States, what are the challenges and where are the opportunities? Well, look, I think the challenges and the opportunity are really one and the same, that um, you know, the international market from a nonlinear perspective has been somewhat behind the U.S. and now it is accelerating. And, um, you know, again, uh, Finn, Nina, my, uh, my phenomenal sales team spend a lot of time figuring out the um, content management, the rights management, the windowing of our content to be sure that we are um, putting that content in the hands of as many kids as we can. And that's the one thing, certainly over the last 10 years, that has become increasingly more complicated. But it's also presented tremendous opportunities uh, for all of us. So. Were there more questions? Thank you. Um, there was a presentation earlier on showing kids' favorite brands in various countries, and Candy Crush Saga was massive, and Minecraft was massive. And one of those doesn't have a story, and the other one doesn't have a story or characters. And I wonder what you think when you look at some of those things coming from mobile that are very untraditional story things, mm -hmm. and what it means for what you guys are doing and how you see the market. Yeah, it's a very good question. So we, um, we are in the mobile gaming business, um, and, um, and um, uh, Backflip, which is our mobile gaming company, has a very, very popular game called Dragonvale. Dragonvale, other than having a lot of dragons, didn't really have character and story, and yet it's very successful. I see those as platforms to create a bigger story universe. Minecraft's gonna be made into a movie. It will be a hugely successful movie because mobile storytelling has kind of incubated that market and it then creates a tremendous platform to you know, blow that world out. Another very recent example for us is we own a game called Ouija or Ouija. Anybody heard of Ouija? It's a spirit board, yeah? Okay, it's a very popular game. But it's a game that doesn't really have story. It's just about kind of your own self-seance. 
And we decided a couple of years ago that notwithstanding how successful that game is, we wanted to create, it was an opportunity to create a real story and characters around it. And so we made a movie with uh, Universal and it grossed $103 million uh, globally, which was a huge success on a very small budget, by the way. And we're already in production on the second one. So um, not every brand requires um, a TV show or movie. Not every mobile game does. Um, not any console. Every console game does. But you know those opportunities are there, and uh, and we love to take advantage of that if we can. Any more questions? So right now. So what's your current strategy right now? So for the toy and the contents, who start first? You start a toy for. <laughs> It's a chicken and an egg yeah. question, yeah. What's uh, now? Because yeah. it was so various right. platforms, what are, what are you gonna do with it? So, you know, interestingly, you know, again, the opportunity and the challenge for a company like Hasbro that has so many brands, clearly we're driven by our uh, brand priorities. You know, we have our kind of franchise brands, we have challenger brands, we have vault brands, you know, some, are marketed in different ways. Some are marketed more significantly to, in different channels, depending on what the brand is. I would say, in our case, we're really supporting that brand blueprint with our great Hasbro brands. Um, and in most cases, those brands either have or have had in the past a toy or a game associated with them. Now, not in all instances is that the case, but as a branded play company and as a consumer products and a content company, you know, we've got this great, great opportunity to marry the two. So clearly we're very focused on our brands. Looking ahead, as children continue to be digital natives, because mm. right, for how many years now, children being born are born into a world with yeah. iPhones, iPads, right. and everything else. T TV is, you know, the TV is like Kleenex. It's just like the euphemism, right? It's the catch-all phrase for any screen exactly. or any engagement with content. Exactly. So they're digital natives. They are more and more media savvy. As we said before, they know how to find the stuff, even from a very, very young age. Mm. I mean, you have two-year-olds who know how to swim. <laughs> yeah, I read an interesting statistic the other day that over 42% of children under the age of three engage with either an iPad or a mobile phone for their primary source of content yeah. every day. It's crazy. That's crazy. I saw a two-year-old recently came to my iPad, not my iPad, my, my laptop, and tried swiping and got very upset that nothing yeah. was happening because they know exactly I what to do. I find three-year-olds to help me figure out my iPhone because yeah. they really know how to do it. <laughs> I don't. Anyway, so yeah. we have this new environment, this new world out there since that has changed so much since you started in the business. And I'm not saying in you're the dark old. Ages. No, no, I'm not saying you're <laughs> old. You're very experienced. What does Hasbro, and not only Hasbro, what do children's content companies need to do to remain relevant. It's like kids are on this high, high velocity train going well, and how do, you, how do you get their attention? How do yeah, you remain it, it, It's about engagement um, and understanding that uh, the, the generation of kids you know, <laughs> that we're engaging with <clears throat> do have so many choices and um, you know, a relatively short attention span, which I think has probably become more acute as a result of the digitalization of our business. And that, um, somebody said this in the, uh, in the earlier panel, I think the uh, gentleman from HIT, um, being authentic is really important. Consumers have very little tolerance for, you know, 22 minute or 72 plus minute commercials. They really want to be engaged. And it's about great stories and about great characters and about understanding how you can be as relevant and um, immersive and engaged with a three-year-old as you are with a 14-year-old. And that is a challenge in storytelling. But if, it, if, it's, if it's something you set out as an objective, um, you can be successful. And I think you know, our success is a testament to that. You have 40 seconds left. Oh my God. Any, right. any clothing, quick, closing? How thoughts? about a quick question? Yeah, quick question. Quick, two quick questions. Anything? Anybody? Yep. Just speak loud.
speaking of yeah. a child audience without compromising on quality. Thank you. Right. Yeah. No. It's a it's a it's a great question. And look, quality is number one. And frankly, although speed to market is too, <clears throat> I think you, quality has to be number one. Um, but it's through the innovations group in part. Um, we have a tremendous development engine that is constantly developing content, constantly developing product, constantly looking at how we drive um, licensing. Licensing in consumer products is often a, a very fast way to get to market. Toys to Life present a very fast way to create um, immersive, engaging experiences between the physical and the digital. Um, short form content is often more, you know, uh, speed to market, allows you more speed to market. Um, but it is, it is something that is really, really important for us to, be re to remain relevant. All right. Well, I would continue, but I think our time has come to an end. Oh, it's been so much fun. Thank, thank you, everybody, for coming you. out on a rainy Saturday. Thank you. Appreciate it.